Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining this uh, session. Apparently, you're the curious people in this uh, conference. Uh, I'm not going to talk about microservices nor aggregates, uh, but we're going to talk about behavior of systems. Huh? Uh, the, um, the thing is that we, if we look at behavior of systems, we could express it as a summation of functions in time. And I'm going to explain you what I mean with functions in time uh, a little bit later on. Um, but um, perhaps first a little word about myself. I've been a lot of things during my career. I started out as a developer. I've been an analyst, functional and business analyst, integration architect, whatever you call it. But um, it, it, uh, it seems to me that the most important thing in uh, the things that we do is delivering value to the business. That's my mission. That's uh, the goal in, of the whole idea. I don't know uh, in the room um, if there are people that are really uh, put a project in production. So do you feel comfortable at that time if, when you push the button into production? It depends, okay. The most of you have still a lot of hair, so that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, I found it uh, during my career, it's still a stressful situation. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, we've been doing a lot of things to avoiding that stressful uh, situation. Situation We've come up with uh, unit testing, integration testing, DevOps and so on, and so, and so we are really, are doing great things to, to make the quality and uh, to lower the risk of, uh, of the business taking into uh, a, a new application or a new, uh, uh, a new process. But um, I believe we are still not there. Huh? So uh, we are still a very young domain uh, and uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, so let's look uh, at the behavior as a summation of functions in time. Uh, what do I mean? So when we start an application, when we start a project, the first thing that we do is we, we study the behavior, we study uh, the current behavior of the business. Uh, that's the first thing, that's our starting point. We need to learn it. Then uh, we, we, uh, we push it in, in some requirements, uh, business use cases, product use cases, stories, whatever you call it. And you try to drive a new kind of uh, desired behavior. So you, you, you're trying to change the things that are uh, been doing. So if we look at behavior as a function in time, uh, we could also say, for, uh, why don't we study those functions? And uh, uh, what I mean with that is, uh, let me tell you a, a small story about a fictitious story. I hope it doesn't happen to you, but say you, we have a patient, uh, we have someone that has a terminal disease, and uh, he goes to see the doctor, and the doctor says, okay, we're going to try to cure you. It's not, it's not an easy job. Uh, we're going to explore your body. We're going to do some scans. We're going to uh, do some investigations. We're going to do some lab results, uh, analysis. And the patient says, okay, fine. We can. He comes back in a couple of weeks and the doc says, I have terrific news. Uh, you're very unique. I found a very unique treatment for you. It's a combination with medical cocktails, some uh, surgery. Uh, it's never been built before. It's very special, very unique. And uh, we're going we're gonna to execute it on you. We're going to deploy it on you uh, as a person. And, and I, we talked with, with other specialists. I'm the best in my field as a doctor, so I'm really glad that, that we come up with such, such a terrific solution. And the patient says, okay, great, doc, great. But um, do you have any idea how I'm going to react to that treatment? How it's going to affect me? And the doc says, well, I haven't the faintest idea. You're a unique body. You have only one body. It's the first time we're going to deploy it to you. So how could I possibly know how you're going to react? OK. <laughs> uh, so you're going to live or you're going to die. That's the, that's the game. 
So I don't see if you see the comparison in deploying new projects. So we build something that has never been built before, and we deploy it, and it's never been deployed before. And the, and the business needs to take it into account, and we have actually no idea how the business is going to react to that new element, to that new uh, fact of life. So, how could we avoid that, or how could we uh, make that uh, risk a little bit lower? So, if we, if, we, if we look at the functions in time, and it's actually the things that can, can happen in reality, and if we think about it, there are only two things in reality that can happen. I call it the expressible stuff on the one side. The expressible stuff is something that we can put in a formula, something that we can very strictly define. It's uh, mostly machine physics related, and it's stuff like heating, vaporization, uh, machine capacity, uh, some dependency expressions. It's very strict, very rest giving. It's, uh, it's, it's fantastic. On the other side, we have the, we have the ad hoc stuff. It's, the, it's the, the, the things that we can't really express. It's just happening. It's mo mostly human related. Uh, uh, we can see it as a, as a kind of set of events, a stream of events. Things just appear happen and uh, those things are like customer orders uh, for example we, we actually don't really know the the exact split second when the customer is going to push the button uh, it starts raining a car accident uh, marriage it's pretty pretty unpredictable uh, some of you uh, probably know or it's just uh, uh, not expressible uh, in a formula. You can have a bad gin, gin tonic at the bar, it could, could happen to you. It rarely happens, but it's, it's just not predictable. Uh, and uh, actually, we, we don't, we very like, as IT people, we like the left side uh, because we can code that. We can take it up in, into our requirements and we can work with it. Uh, we don't like the right side, the non expressible stuff. That's difficult. We, we can't really take it up into a domain or in business rules. We call it sometimes chaos, or we keep it outside our system because we just can't model it. And what we are trying to do, or tending to do, is making the unexpressible expressible. And we take averages. We say customer orders, OK, an average, it's about five customer orders per hour, for example. So we can do something with that, and we make it expressible. But as soon as, as we take an average, really, we start lying. It's never correct. At a certain point in time, the average is never correct. So how can we handle that? So let's go back to, to, the, to that function in time uh, theory. Um, of course, functions in time need data. Time is really data is happening. We have the stream of events. Uh, we need that. Uh, so we need the data. We need the data preparation. We need the data science. But now data is everywhere. So and compared to the old days, we can't give an excuse that we don't have the data. The data is there. And if it's not there, it's, it's very cheap to get it there. We can play, place a sensor, whatever. We can call public APIs. Uh, there's no reason not to have the data. So it seems logic that uh, if we take those functions in time, we have in the closet a science uh, called system dynamics. I'm going to explain what it exactly is. Um, to express those functions in time, to model those. So if we could do that, it should uh, really be interesting because then we have two ways uh, to, see how those, that, that, to see how the business is going to react to the, to the new system. So first of all, we can simulate it. That's already a good thing. Compared to the patient, we can't simulate it because we have only one chance to deploy it to the patient. 
if we could have a, of, if we could build a system that we can simulate the impact on the business it would much be more comfortable and lower the, the risk to take it into uh, adaption and the good news is that once we have the model we can actually also run it in production so um, when the model is, is there in production, we, we switch from averages to real data uh, streams. And so we, we replace the averages, we replace the five or, uh, customer orders per hour with the real triggers of the customer order, and the model adapts. So that's very, very powerful. So it seems logic if we study behavior to meet those requirements or to, to, to define those requirements, it seems logic that we, uh, first of all, can verify when the model runs if we actually reach the desired behavior, because that's some and, and a lot of projects we design, we develop, we deploy, and we walk away. And, and the business is going to monitor and, and just uh, see what happens and uh, makes, uh, make changes. So we can actually verify if the desired behavior is actually met. And it seems logic if we study the behavior that we should look into if there's something like modeling of behavior that we can study that modeling. It, it would be interesting to, to have a look at that. And that's, that's what I did. So first of all, um, a little word on, on system dynamics. Actually, it's part of a, a more uh, conceptual area of systems thinking. Probably uh, some people know it. Um, it's about um, taking a look at the system as a whole. We, we are used to uh, dividing complex systems in several divisions and businesses we're going to take a look at sales, at marketing, at production, uh, but act, that's a good thing. That's that's uh, that's also domain driven. Eh? So we we need we need to to search for the aggregates and see what those boundaries are. But um, in real life, uh, a business is a system as a whole. It just don't. It's not a summation of sales, marketing, production. It's more than that. It's it's kind of. Uh, yeah, it's a system, yeah? and uh, like a body, a body is more than than, than legs and feet and, and arms. So uh, typically, for uh, a system, it has an an emerging uh, property. It's it has characteristics that are not to be assigned to a part of the body. Just like a business has a kind of character that is not just defined by marketing or production or whatever. So that's, that's the theory to look at the system as a whole. And that's the system's thinking. It was uh, the system dynamics, uh, especially, was invented by, uh, by quite a genius. If you, if you look at, at his uh, accomplishments, uh, he was the, the guy that actually uh, invented uh, random access memory. First, it was also. Uh, the guy that um, did a lot of work for all business computers as we know them today. And he also invented system dynamics because he was convinced that the, the things that were available to him were not sufficient to handle complex processes. And that was even before IT was known, it was more in an, an industrial uh, kind of context. Uh, we have complex uh, industrial processes, how can we model that? How can we see what's the behavior? Where are the bottlenecks in that process? Uh, how is that going to react? OK. Yeah, that was the difficult slide. Um, because we talked a lot about conceptual things. Uh, now we need to go to, to some more practical things. And I stole this from, from Cyril. I don't know if you saw the talk. 
it's now time to, let's say, wipe the mind and uh, check your phone or something. But, uh, now we, we're going to get in the more nitty gritty stuff of uh, system dynamics and see how it's practically done. So let's take an example, a very simple BPMN example of a, a two-step process. Uh, it's just, if you look at the middle, we have some approval requests coming in, and there's a two-step. The first stage, we have approval one unit or person or desk needs to approve it and can discard it or can uh, approve it, and it goes to the second approver when he or she or that unit that decides to approve it, it's really approved or it gets rejected. So more simple, we can't uh, get as a, a flow. Uh, so um, it's something that uh, happens in reality. And if we would model that in system dynamics, we would come up with something like that. It's totally different, but if we, if we look at it, we have <coughs> some, uh, some orders, some ap approval requests coming in. Those boxes are really, you should look at the boxes as, as kind of piles. It piles up and it goes down. It's kind of, it's a stock level. So it comes in, we have some kind of delay. We need to bring it if it's di digital or, or just manual, it doesn't matter. We need to, to bring it to the, to the desk of approver one, and he gets also a, a pile of approvals uh, or of a, a pile of requests uh, that he needs to approve or reject. So, or he brings it to the desk of approver two, or he rejects it. And then we have a pile of a number of rejected requests. And if the approval two uh, approves it, we have finally a pile of actually totally approved uh, requests. So it's, it's the same model, but it's from a different kind of view. So if we go back, we don't see the piles here. So we, we don't see the, the behavior. We see the design of the process but we don't see what actually is piling up and piling down. Okay, why is it so solid system dynamics? Why is it so, to me, the, the source of truth? It's just based on pure mathematics. So, uh, the Forrester guy just build it from, from uh, integral equations. So a stock level is nothing more than an integral equation going from zero in time to a certain end time, taking things piling up, things coming in, and things going out in a, in a portion of the difference in time, your time uni unit. So it's pure mathematics. So you can't get any, anything against it. It's good news for, the, for our uh, IT people because if it's mathematics, we can actually code it. So it's, it's expressible. So we can take it up into code. Of course, if we think a little bit more about the model, we need to... Uh, to define some dependencies. And it looks a little bit complex, but okay, that it's what it is. Uh, we have uh, a request rate, we have actually a launch delay, we have a starting number of approvers, before, uh, for example. We have, we have an average percentage of, uh, uh, of requests that are approved at stage one. We have an average at stage two, and so on. And these things influence the flow between the elements, between the stocks. We need to define how fast is the pile going down? How fast is the 
the file going up. So these are the A and B expressions in the, in the, in the formula. Of course, you see averages because we, we are now in kind of simulation mode and we inject those averages. So let's, let's ask a business question here for, for this very simple model. Uh, say we have a set of given elements. Say we have an, a request coming in at two per minute. Uh, we have an average time of evaluation uh, in step one of two minutes, in step two of six minutes, and uh, a 70% approval rate uh, at step one and 55 at step uh, two. So a reasonable question would be to business or from, from the business, tell me what's the minimum staffing given that set of parameters What's the minimum staffing on approval one and on approval two unit? That seems a very fair question to ask to, to IT people. And, and OK, we're going to deploy that process. What, what do we need? How much FTEs do we need? Anyone? You have an idea? So of course, it's doable if, if, you, uh, if I would give you Excel and and, and I'll leave you to it in, in, a, in a couple of minutes, you, you, you would figure it out. Uh, but it's not something that we just can snap up and say, OK, that's the answer. Even in such a very simple process, we are 2019. We have microservices. <laughs> It's not going to answer that, that business question. And you, you could imagine if it gets more complex that even with an Excel sheet, you would need a couple of days perhaps or weeks to figure it out. And that's just for one set of parameters. So imagine you could answer all those business questions just automatically by running the model. How cool would that be? Hmm. So let's run the previous model, the previous system, system dynamics model. Uh, let's run it in simulation and uh, let's, let's have a look what, what that's doing. So if we, if we run it with one FTE at approval one and one FTE at approval two, we have uh, here three graphs and uh, watch the, let's say the, the axis uh, we have here in approval one, if we just put uh, one FTE, we are piling up at the end of the day, eight hours, for 480 minutes. At the end of the day, there are 700 requests laying on the desk. That's not workable. For business, that's not workable because the day after, we start with 700. So that's, that's no throughput. That's not doable. At approval two desk, we have a little bit more uh, or better results, but still we have a pile of 150. Not doable, not, it's not an option to push this model to the business, assuming that we're going to run it with one and one uh, FTEs on, on both uh, units. So let's see what happens if we push some uh, FTEs on the, on the first approval. It's getting better. We have 225 pile at uh, desk one. Of course, it's getting better. We push more people to it. And of course, at uh, desk two, uh, we have another number, 400. And uh, but the total result, if we compare it to the previous one, it's, it, it's at the, the business world, the result is the same. We only have about 80 uh, approved requests. So it's no use to push another FTE. Uh, another 70, 100 grand uh, to spend to solve this problem. It's not going to change anything. Uh, so uh, this is also not a solution. If we, if we even uh, push four people, we see a different reaction. We see a kind of oscillation here. And that's getting better because if we look at this, we see much better results. We see that about between six and eight requests are at the end of the day are lying on in pile one. So that's 
that that's workable. And second day, six or eight requests. Uh, that's that's a throughput. We see a throughput. Uh, of course, the, the guy at approval two is just getting more uh, approvals. Uh, so, so we create a bottleneck at, uh, at approval two desk. So that's, uh, that's still a problem. Um, and the end result is, of course, not influenced because the bottleneck is here. So compared to the one one, we already have uh, three extra people, but it's no real business difference. Say we, we push five people on desk one to see just the difference between the previous one. So we, the previous one, we have six, eight, one extra. We have about from two to eight requests laying at the end of the day at desk one. OK, the two is better than the six, but it's still not worthwhile to push another FTE there. That's, that's not, that's not uh, worthwhile the money. Also, the end result is still about 80, so that's no, no, no deal. So let's go back to the four. That's better. And um, uh, push another guy to the, or woman, to the approval two. And we see, of course, that the end result is getting better. That's logic. The bottleneck is, is, uh, is much better managed. And if we uh, go to three people, we see the oscillation coming up at approval two desk, and we have about five until nine uh, requests uh, and a throughput. And we see an amazing, a better result about, in, instead of 80, we have now 450 uh, approved requests. So the answer is four at desk one and three people at desk two. So that's just a simple simulation, but that answers a very fair business uh, question, how many people do we need in that, in that, in that case? And the good news is that, OK, we run it now for a certain kind of average set. But if you run it in production and you push the real number of requests that are coming in into the model, the model is going to say, OK, you can drop FTEs or you need to raise FTEs, but it's going to tell you what to do to avoid getting a pile of requests at the end of the day. So you, the, that information is, is in, in the model. So it's very valuable uh, to have that. OK, let me tell you. Uh, so that's almost, that's very, very, let's say, nice to hear. But is it, is it actually doable in, in real life projects? So let me tell you a story um, of a real-life project that we did at Bridgestone. You need to go through the basic flow here. So um, uh, Bridgestone is a company that uh, constructs uh, tires. Everyone knows Bridgestone, uh, probably. And um, we are in Belgium, we have a, the, the harbor called Zeebrugge or Zeebrugge. Um, Tires are coming in into, into containers. I need to go to the first warehouse, inland warehouse, and to be stocked in the, in the warehouse. Very, at first sight, a simple process. They have short driving times from harbor. They pick up a full container of uh, tires. They drive it to the, to the Bridgestone warehouse at the yard. They drop it. People uh, unload it. And the empty container goes back to the, to the harbor for reuse. Um, we made a project that um, automatically dispatched the container number to the driver to say, this is the container that you need to pick up. This is the terminal that you need to get it. To get it and um, these are your access codes and so on. So it was a nice project. It's, uh, uh, it was needed because there was a lot of chaos. There were two dispatchers, one at the transporter level, one at the Bridgestone level, exchanging excels, calling, solving problems, you know, the drill. We solved it. We made an algorithm that uh, uh, dynamically decided which container need to, that, was, uh, that had the highest priority. We avoided empty driving, and there were a couple of uh, 
business goals. Um, for example, uh, the warehouse staff need sufficient work, so they need containers to unload. Uh, so that, that's one. Uh, um, the drivers needed to be activated at the correct time. Uh, uh, we have too many drivers. We have uh, not enough drivers to meet our SLA. Avoid empty driving. Uh, we need, of course, free addresses available, and so on. Uh, and okay, we, we we did it in a traditional way. We made a Java application. We we built the, the algorithms, and we, uh, we we put it online. We deployed it, and um, we were very happy actually because we did all. The, the, the unit testing, integration testing, uh, we had very little problems to deploy it. And actually, it was quite a success. So drivers got dispatched, and the process was flowing, and everyone was happy. But in a few days, um, we, we, uh, we saw, we, we got a, a report coming in that drivers were waiting at the yard, uh, and uh, they were blocked. Uh, so there were no free yard addresses anymore. So the, the process was uh, optimized, but the waiting lines at the terminal that used to be a problem replaced, were replaced by waiting times at the yard. So the, the process was optimized, but the system yeah, it was, was not uh, slowing down the process. Uh, of course, it, it, did, it didn't see the bottleneck. And actually, it came that worse that uh, drivers needed to wait hours and hours, and uh, we needed to pull the plug. So we, we needed to take the system down, back to paper, back to the Excel exchange. And so it was quite a disaster. And that was the time that um, we already were busy with system dynamics, and we built a small model, a small model, in reality, even uh, a small model, small, small model is, is uh, quite extensive, um, but we, uh, we build a system dynamics uh, diagram, a multi-cause diagram, to see how that process was running and how those flows were going. Uh, and you have, in an, and typically in a more complex uh, systems uh, dynamics model, you have positive feedback loops and negative feedback loops. In, in reality, the, the things uh, aren't optimized uh, just at one point or in one point of view. So you, you, you have a lot of, uh, let's say, constraints that uh, are wor working together or against each other. So uh, we built that, that, that uh, dynamics model, we code it, and um, we put it back in production. Oh, sorry. We put it back in production. And, and solve the problem. So it was, now it's balancing between uh, the number of drivers that, uh, that, we are, need, that are needed to make the, the SLA. And if, and if we see that the, the, the number of yard addresses uh, are going to be a problem, uh, the system reports it to humans. So actually, it's still possible or it would be possible to automatically correct the system, but that we didn't, didn't do yet. So, uh, uh, but it's it's already uh, escalating the problem to humans. For okay, if you don't do anything and you're running the system with the real life parameters that we are now seeing, you're going to get in problem uh, in, in trouble in in uh, in Friday or next week Wednesday. So uh, do something about it or. We're going to get in trouble. Okay. So um, that's the behavior of functions in time. Eh? So why why should we use uh, system dynamics? Eh? And why didn't we need it before? That's the strange thing. It's it's been here along for. For so long, it's designed in the 1950s, uh, but somehow we didn't pick it up in IT uh, country. Uh, it's used today in very complex uh, designs of processes, but it, it, it isn't used in IT country, and that's uh, something strange because we uh, people that are looking at, for example, city designs, city traffic designs. 
are using system dynamics to solve the problem. That's not an easy problem to solve if you need to come up with a new uh, driving uh, or city plan in Rome, for example. You can imagine that you're not going to solve it with Excel. So system dynamics is used for such problems. It's even used in uh, social, uh, let's say, um, uh, world problems. Uh, disasters, uh, there's even um, a model, it's called World Tree. You should Google it, World Tree, it's the predicament of mankind. Where, uh, when are we going to die? Uh, of course, it's not correct, uh, but it's, it's cool to see the model. And uh, there are a lot of intellectuals that, that the Club of Rome, for example, uses it to, to investigate uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of problems. So why, why should we use it, or why I'm trying to convince you to, to have a look at it? Because I'm 100% I'm certain that the next level of IT systems will need that kind of um, modeling behavior. Uh, we, we, we need to see if the patient is going to die, yes or no because uh, the IT systems now are so complex and are so important for business that business, business is not able to, to have a failure. So it's, it's no longer just an accounting system. It's just not longer we have the core business and we have some IT supporting stuff. Now, now we have... Uh, IT and we have business. If the IT is going down, your business is, is, out, of, is out of business, it's going down. So it's, it's, it's core. So there's no excuse not to spend money on extra modeling effort or um, let's say uh, business is not, uh, can't or can't afford uh, the risk for a failing core IT project. Uh, New systems are also more complex than, than they used to be. We have dynamic algorithms. We need them to uh, react to ever-changing and fast-changing business. So um, that's why. Also, data is everywhere. So that's also not an excuse. There's even data where the, before the new system is in place. We can investigate it. We have machine learning algorithms. Very cool to do so, some stuff with that. Um, we, we can learn from the existing data and we can extract a behavioral model from, uh, from that. And so uh, the data is, is, uh, is everywhere. We can replace average, consumption, uh, average assumptions. We can replace them now with real life data. So we have the Kafka streams, we have the, the events, we can process billions of events uh, in, uh, in a very short time. So we, we, let's use them. Let's inject them into such models and use them to predict in real life the coming uh, bottlenecks. Imagine what, how much money would would save if you could run a business with an ideal resource allocation. Get rid of the, the extras that you just put there to avoid trouble. Start simple, enjoy the process. Uh, so there's, there's a difference between hard and soft systems thinking. That's, uh, that's really, if, if you have a problem uh, in, in IT business bounded context, it's hard systems thinking. So you, you define your bounded context and that's it. That, that's the world that, that you're living in. Uh, soft thinking is more if you, if you take the whole world into account. If you, that's, that's not solvable. It's very useful to, to draw uh, multi-cause diagrams. It's going to learn you a lot, but it's not actually going to solve your problem. But if you start, that's not really a problem. It's like modeling techniques, if you use whatever that you use, it's never right the first time. So it's an iteration, and the iteration um, 
let's say, uh, gives you a lot of knowledge. So, and that's the same with, with system modeling. Um, yeah, learn the, the work of Russell Akoff and uh, Mr. Garadachi. Uh, there are more systems thinking guys, but they wrote a lot of uh, good stuff about the subject. Um, and um, I, I, I would advise you to, uh, to at least look at those uh, papers that they wrote. And there's a good, if you get really hands-on, so Vensum, if you, if you Google it, Vensum, there's a new uh, version out there, Ventity, uh, but if you just Google System Dynamics Vensum, you will find a, a kind of workbench to model it, and there you can run your, um, uh, your model and you can uh, even upload or link uh, data sets. Uh, of course, it's not useful to put in a real life a production. If you, if you go there, you need to code it, you need to code those integral equations. But to play around and to see what, what to get a feeling uh, of, your, uh, of your model is a very good workbench uh, to do it. And it's, you don't have to write integral equations and the, 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 the tool will, will, will do it for you. So, uh, also, there's a, there's a professor, uh, a Dutch professor, Eric Preut, uh, from the uh, University of, of Delft that has a, a very terrific online course for system dynamics. So I, I could really advise you if you need uh, to get a grip on it. Um, he has terrific examples. Um, it's not really IT rela related because that's, that's the whole uh, problem. And so the, the guys that are doing system dynamics are not IT guys, but we as IT guys could definitely, definitely use it. So um, that's about it. Um, I hope I, uh, I convinced you uh, to have a look at it. I hope I convinced you that at the next level of process design will be process behavior. We are struggling now with, with to get the process design right. But once we are getting there, we're going to start modeling process behavior because that's the thing that we need to do if we want uh, the business patient not to die. So I thank you for your attention. We have some uh, time for QA, uh, I believe. Yeah, if you want to ask a question, let me know and I'll come with, uh, with the microphone. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think, uh, uh, I guess that a, a, a big problem in this field is that you have a lot of ex uh, ex uh, exponential complexity uh, MP uh, algorithms you have to deal with. So um, do you think that uh, there is a lot of movement in, in, that, in that field at the moment? Um, big, big problems are being solved? Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that if you have a complex domain, it's, uh, it's a way of getting grip on it. Uh, so you start with what is influencing what. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it helps you because as humans, if we uh, think about stuff, we are only able to, to grasp uh, three uh, parameters. As, uh, from the moment that are three parameters uh, that are influencing each other, three we can handle. If, if we get more than three and they are all influencing each other, we say, okay, we can't, we can't grasp that. So that, that's, that's mind-blowing, that's chaos. And then we, 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 yeah, we, we try some stuff, but we, we, we don't feel comfortable. If you, if you build a system dynamics model, it's, it's, uh, it's, pure, uh, it's, it's pure nature. If you start doing it, it's actually very addictive and you're, you're going uh, just to love it. It's uh, even even in the in every every flow of uh, of things um, you you can build a model. I once built a, a model for baking pizzas, uh, but it's uh, is so that an answer to your question? Well, may maybe I can expand a little bit. Um, when you uh, when you have three variables or par uh, parameters, of course, a human can maybe grasp it, and if it's becoming bigger, it's only for computers. But at a certain point, 
um, there are a lot of there are too much parameters for a computer to to even solve the problem uh, because enumeration is not really uh, feasible anymore. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever hit that limit where um, you had you, the com the computer was was unable to to process all the no no because for for a the model translates itself in just uh, mathematical equations, so it's for for the, for the computer is that's not really a problem. Um, um, in, in, to me, there are two ways or two elements that we have today to capture uh, very complex domains. Uh, one is the the domain of uh, machine learning and deep learning. So if you have a lot of parameters, say uh, a claim in, in, in insurance. Uh, so a claim has a lot of properties. Uh, uh, if you need to classify that, uh, we can go to machine learning algorithms and feed them with a lot of historic data, and we can do terrific classifications. But that's, that's nothing about how um, systems behave. Uh, so the, the machine learning algorithm will not tell you what stuff influences other stuff. So we, we as humans will need to figure out, just as we figure out um, BPMN flows, or just that, that we figure out, OK, what are the boundaries in, in a domain-driven context, uh, what, what, is, what needs to be isolated and what not, we can think about um, of every uh, area that, that we encounter, we can think what stuff influences what stuff. Uh, and then you, you put it in your model, and then it, is it expresses it in mathematical functions, and you can run it. For me, there's no limit uh, into the design. No. OK, are there any more questions? <coughs> I was uh, interested in your example. Uh, can you uh, explain a bit uh, what you needed to change in the parameters to solve this blocking of the the, the yard um, availability? Oh, um, well, we we needed to put the model in there, and then um, uh, it's. Uh, uh, once you have this, well, it should be take too much time to really explain the whole thing, but um, you have, um, for example, here you have uh, the number of containers piling up at the terminal. Um, and of course, um, that's, that's a plus that uh, influences the number of containers on the terminal going, is going to influence the containers on yards per day. If there are no containers at the terminal, that's that's a resource, of course. So, uh, but we we also um, bring back uh, empty containers, uh, and and that that gives you a loop, and you have a lot of parameters. But the, all those parameters were already in the system, and if they were not, we could actually easily calculate them because this was, it was already there. So. Um, uh, of, or, of course, we did a, a couple of abstractions, or we, we uh, needed to do a couple of averages. For example, transport time over C and days. That was not a live data stream. So we didn't have the data really. Uh, actually, now the data is already there. But at that time, we didn't have the data of, of uh, containers coming in. So we, we took the all the parameters that we had in the system already and that were changing every split second, and we pushed it into the model, and we distracted uh, actually those, um, uh, those free addresses were very important uh, to us to, to see that the, the free addresses didn't fall to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, if we run the application and we see in three days the, the order addresses is going to go down, then we can do two things, and that's up to, b to business then to decide. Uh, so you, you could even push algorithms in there to automatically uh, balance it. But now it just says, OK, uh, by next week, Friday, we don't going to have free addresses. There are two things that you can do. You can diminish the number of people in the warehouse to unload. 
uh, increase them, uh, so increase the number of people to unload so that, so that you had, get a better throughput, or you can uh, uh, diminish uh, the number of drivers that uh, are online uh, to, to bring the containers. And that's, that's a decision that business needs to make. Okay. Yeah, so that, those were the factors that you could actually change. The people in the warehouse, the drivers, maybe some other things. Yeah. And so did you let the system um, suggest the changes yeah. to be made? Yeah. The, the system says, okay, if um, uh, you need to drop two drivers, for example, or you need to add one or two, so the number of drivers. How about... Uh, making the system forecast or maybe adjust things when things start to happen? Is that something that you're looking into? Yeah, the, the, the model uses the parameters and says, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, use this set of current parameters and I'm going to simulate it. It's like, it's like weather forecasting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you always take uh, the real historic data. Uh, so we, we, we we're going to know uh, much better the, the weather uh, for Monday on Sunday because we have more historic data. Uh, so, so it's it, and you have, yeah, you, you, you always simulate it for the, the days to come. Yeah, so are, are you saying that before when you needed to take the system out of production because it wasn't working, it was unable to adapt, and now it is able to adapt. Yeah, we didn't know it, and we didn't know it. So we just, business needed to look at it, and, and we, there was a bottleneck uh, arising, but that no, one, no one saw it coming. And now we see it coming. And that's, that's the, and, and a even a, a step further to me would be that even the system decides uh, not to uh, not to activate the driver when it is not necessary. So there's even a, a step a step forward, and that's the whole idea of uh, autonomous applications. Uh, if if you if you look for example, Oracle is totally into autonomously. Uh, so they they build an auto autonomously uh, database because who is more who is the smartest thing or a uh, guy that knows the database. It's the database itself, because it knows the queries, it knows it, so it's self-optimizing. So it's, it, it, it's weird that, we, that a, a DB admin needs to define uh, optimizations for the database, but the, but the database is the, is the domain expert. So, uh, yeah. And we need to pull that in all our applications, and system dynamics is really um, that's a helpful uh, design tool to do that. Perhaps in future there will be other things uh, that can help us. But my message is that we certainly need to investigate that behavioral design uh, to avoid disasters uh, f when we deploy stuff. And that's not in a technical way. I'd like to follow on the same example in questioning. Because when you were describing it and how you didn't foresee that bottleneck, it, it made me wonder if, if there's a way that in doing these models, you could involve the people who are in the actual roles. Because that's yeah. how we adapt the systems in Agile, right? Yeah. We get everybody having a same sense of overall purpose. I'm not sure if that's possible if you have a lot of people involved and they're not that aware of how all oh. the roles interrelate. But I wonder if somebody has thought about trying to involve them more directly in evolving the model so that while you're developing it, you might head off some of the kind of things that you don't foresee in the math at first because of things you just don't sure. know. Sure. It's, it's, it's the same like any other modeling technique. It should be a collaboration with business. And if, if, you, uh, if you build a high-level uh, entity model. I, I collaborate with business. I'm checking, uh, okay, is this relation, is this one-to-one -one or one-to-many? You know it. So if we build this application, if we build this model, you, you can communicate. Uh, so it, it's the same like, uh, okay, of course, it takes a little bit of time, but you, you, you can say, okay, the amount of unloading staff is that something that influences the number of unloading uh, full containers per day? That, that's an obvious 
but perhaps there are, there are other constraints. And perhaps they say, okay, we, we need a machine for that, and there's only uh, so many machines for that. So that's, that's another constraint. So you, you need to collaborate and check that, that, that model with, uh, with the domain experts, certainly. Well, yeah. What I was getting at is whether there's some sort of a live way to help the, like the warehouse people and the drivers m help you monitor the model the first time you're trying it out. That was yeah. more like what I was yeah, thinking. Yeah, that, that we used um, the, that Vensum workbench. Mm -hmm. You do so when the model is everyone, when the model is agreed upon, and you do some simulation with the workbench, and then you say, okay, this is the behavior that the model uh, predicts. Do you agree? And first time they, they don't agree because the model is wrong. We forgot something. And that's the nice thing about it. You can actually verify it. So as long as the model simulation is not producing real life scenarios, there's something wrong with the model. If, if, uh, if the model in my two-step uh, approval would say, okay, we have 10,000 pile of requests, and you, you would go to administration and they would say, no, no, that's not possible. <laughs> so you have some kind of verification point. That's uh, all the time we have for questions. Uh, thank you, Wim, yeah. for uh, an excellent talk. Thank you. Give it thank up you very again. much. <laughs>